so the first teaching that I uh, want to go through is is uh, SWOT, uh, SWOT 2024. Um, SWOT stands for, for those who might not be familiar with the term, it's um, it's commonly a, a term that businesses and, and organizations, churches use uh, to evaluate the current state of the organization. SWOT is an acronym that stands for Strengths, Weaknesses, Opportunities, Threats. So whenever you know, uh, teams get together and they start analyzing and saying, okay, what are our strengths? What do we do well? Um, what are our weaknesses? Where can we improve? What are some opportunities that we should take advantage of? What are some threats that uh, we should avoid? So I called this session that because this is kind of um, my little uh, SWOT analysis of our organization, things that I've been praying into going into 2024 and, and thinking on. Uh, some of this is going to be familiar because I've already been preaching into some of this stuff, uh, but just going to do it just kind of an overview. Again, uh, wanting to look at our uh, discipleship model, how effective we're being in making disciples. Uh, our verse, our guiding verse for disciple making is first john 2 uh verse 14 it's actually first john 2 12 to 14 but this is just specifically verse 14 that's in your notes uh john writes this he says i write to you dear children because you know the father i write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning i write to you young men because you are strong and the word of god lives in you and you have overcome the evil one so in these verses, John, a uh, disciple of Jesus, is writing to the early church, and he's writing to um, specifically to the pastors, to the leaders, but he's writing, he says, I write to you, dear children. He's not writing to literally the children's ministry, and he's, he's when he says, I write to you, young man, he's not necessarily writing to just the boys in the youth group, and he says, fathers, not just to the men who've reproduced. He's actually writing um, and, and using... Um, family familiar terms, family terms uh, in regards to spiritual development. So, and we see this all throughout the New Testament that whenever uh, the early church and Jesus in particular uh, begins to communicate what the family of God is like, what the church is like, they use family terms that, you know, brothers, sisters, uh, fathers, mothers, um, children, you know, uh, Young men, like it, it's a lot, a lot of different family terms that the, you know, the, the early church leaders use because the, the church really is supposed to be a family. It's the family of God. So, in this, we have the table and chairs as a diagram in there, and the the left blanks there on each one. The chair at the very bottom of of the diagram. Um, the one that is detached from the table is those represents those who are far from God. So I believe um, to the core of my being that all of us, every single one of us, whether we know it or not, I believe that all of us are on a spiritual journey. Those who know they're on a spiritual journey and those who do not know uh, they're on a spiritual, that all of us are on a spiritual journey at some point. And in that spiritual journey, there's a number of people that are far from God. They're not yet a part of uh, the family of, of God. And, and so that's why the chair is, is detached from the table. Those around the table are then part of the family of God. The, the first chair right above the, the one disconnected from there, the one right above that is, is born again. Jesus said in John 3, lest you be born again, uh, you can now enter into uh, the kingdom of God. So so born again is an interesting term that Jesus uses when he talks about our entry into the family of God. He he calls it a references a new birth and, you know, like a baby, like a newborn baby being born, being born again of the of the spirit. So those are the brand new, brand new babies we get to see in our church. We get to see the, you know, those kind of births happening virtually every week um, in our church, which is really exciting. Then the chair uh, to the left of the table uh, represents little children. So when John writes to the church, he says, I write to you, dear children. I write to you, little children. Uh, little children are are those who are not no longer 
newborns, uh, but they they have uh, survived. They are now have grown a bit. They're little children, but yet as little children, they are still completely dependent on others to feed them, uh, others to take care of them, others to uh, guide them and in, um, in in all things. And so in the faith, they are the ones that are completely dependent on others. They don't know how to read the Bible, so they're completely dependent on others to show them. They don't know how to pray, so they they need guidance in, in how to pray. They don't know how to interact or the importances of the 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 disciplines with other believers and and the participation in church and small groups and and all you know the spiritual disciplines that help all of us grow. They are completely dependent on others to lead them, guide them um, in in the faith. Um, when they mature, the chair at the top of the table then is is young men. And they, it's not uh, based on um, on sex at all. This young men or young women, but it's it's basically representing the the teenagers, those who are now um, independent and have the the ability to then feed themselves. And I love what John says. I write to you, young men, because you're strong, um, and and strong. Why? Because they're strong in the word. God lives in you. They're they're confident they know god lives in them they've overcome the evil one which means they've gone through some spiritual battles and and have been able to overcome the evil one how they overcome the evil one they overcame the evil one because uh they know the word and they use the word just like jesus overcame uh the evil one in the desert when he was tempted he quoted scripture so it's all about um that the scripture and being strong in the word that's young men the the, then the the last chair, the one to the right of the table, is then fathers. So we see a progression. Fathers are now the ones that have dependents. Um, how does a young man become a father? A young man becomes a father when they reproduce, and so this is this is the this signifies that a disciple, according to Jesus, is one who is going to reproduce themselves. That that they're going to lead others to the Lord and um, and and reproduce. So when we see the progression around the table from you know those far from God to becoming born again, then we see them, you know, uh remain. If you remain in my words, my words remain in you. You'll know the truth. The truth sets you free. Um, you'll be disciples indeed. That's becoming little children who are still dependent, dependent on others. Then we progress to young men because we're strong in the word. Then we become fathers. So when I evaluate, do a SWOT analysis on our church, um, you know, I I begin to I look at at this, and I, I number one in the notes below that I see that it says our mission then is to make disciples. We said that right from the beginning of our church. Uh, we we declared this thirteen years ago when I got here. We we talked about mission. Uh, vision model programming that our mission is etched in scripture that the mission is the great commission that jesus gave us in in matthew 28 go go and make disciples of all nations and and that that is the foundation of everything that we do so our mission has not changed and it will not change until jesus comes back so our mission is to make disciples we define a disciple as someone who progresses from being far from God to being born again to becoming uh, a little children dependent to becoming young men independent to becoming uh, fathers reproducing to become dependents. And so therefore, our mission is to make disciples is to make fathers mothers in the faith. That's the command of Jesus. That's not the gentle suggestion. That's the <laughs> that's the great commission, right? So that's uh, that's what we are um, called to do. So number two. What I've an analysis and analyzing our church is that we are really good at the first three stages of discipleship. So we're really good at um, the first three. We're really good at at connecting with those far from God and leading people to Jesus. Last year, um, we we led uh, over four hundred and eighty people to Jesus in the first time in our services through our ministries. And and when you look at that, I mean, we we never take that for granted. That that you know we are a rare majority when it comes to, a rare minority. Sorry, when it comes to to uh, churches 
in North America that see that the type of salvations that we get. And we'll never take that for granted. We're very excited about the fact that we see, you know, close to 500 people. Um, we set a mission out 13 years ago to, to, at, to at least see what we see in the, in the book of Acts, where it says the Lord added to their number daily, those who are being saved. So we said that's a minimum of 365 people a year coming to Jesus. Um, we have maintained that for 13 years, seeing at least 365 plus um, people coming to Jesus. So I would look at that and saying, well done. Like we're, we're doing well. That's a, that's a massive strength for our church. I also, in, in that analysis, I, I think we're good, not great. We're good at retaining those new believers. And in the analysis of that, we see, uh, you know, the becoming little children. Um, and what I mean by good, but not great, um, we're good. We talked to, um, you know, Billy Graham Association, and they say because of, you know, the crusades and different things that they do, that they see about 3% retention of people who get born again, you know, becoming um, little children in, in ministries grafting into the church. We, we see far more than 3% um, that become born again in a service and come back to the church. So we're doing good, but we're not great because we're not seeing high percentages of people that are are retaining and that and then so i think we need to get better at retention which is one reason why we introduced uh rooted and began began doing that is this is a way to graft people to one another in relationship but also to graft people to the word and get an understanding of the word and we're hearing incredible testimonies of people that are going through rooted of how much they're learning in the word and how much they're connecting with one another and that is our attempt to say, hey, this is we need to get better at retention. We need to get better at making the disciples and, and progressing our new believers along um, it, to become grounded in the word. So if you're a scribbler like me and taking notes, I would say one of the things that we want to do, one of our goals to, to help the born again remain long enough to become little children is we want to graft people to community. We want to graft them into relationships, into smaller groups and grow smaller. That's part of what we want to do. So that in between stage there, we want to graft people to community and get them connected as quickly as possible, connected to volunteer teams, connected to small groups, just get them connected in relationships as quickly as possible. The space between little children now and young men is we want to get people grafted to the word. We want them to be anchored in the word, know the word. That's what it, that's what John says. You know, young men, you know the word, you're strong in the word, you overcome the evil one. We want to get people grafted into the word. So in that, I believe rooted accomplishes both those things. It helps people stay grafted into community. And it helps people graft them into the word. So that's a major tool that uh, you know we're we're using and utilizing, encouraging anybody and everybody to get rooted. If you haven't taken rooted, please do. It's it really is amazing. We're going to uh, run another round right after Easter again. So I encourage you to do that. So I would say we are good at the first three stages of discipleship. But number three, I also believe we are weak at the last two stages of discipleship. So while I think we're good as a church at getting people born again, I believe um, that we are, you know, okay at the retention um, and, and young men, I believe that we are very weak at, from our young man stage, the last two stages, young men to, to fathers. And I believe that weakness is not a programming problem i believe that weakness is actually a structural problem and what i mean by that is that our current structure of uh, and and this is not just our structure as as parallel church but our structure in the western way of doing church the western system of church our structure is a sunday centric uh worship and preaching service it's attractional and it's an invite friendly model. Nothing wrong with any of that, but our current model is Sunday centric, mainly driven for one service a week 
it's that service is really surrounded by worship and preaching. If you're to basically evaluate all the churches around North America, you'd see the same thing. It's basically anchored. The services are anchored around worship and preaching. We're an attractional model, which means that we do what we can to attract uh, the the lost, those far from God, into into an experience that they're going to be able to connect with God. That's attractional. And we're an invite friendly model. Everything that we've done for the last 13 years has been has been based on wanting to create services that unchurched people feel comfortable to attend. But really what we're trying to do is we're trying to create services that you feel comfortable in inviting your unchurched friend, family members to come to church. And it's working. It's working at, at bringing people, inviting people in and getting them saved. The problem with that Sunday centric worship, preaching, attractional invite friendly model is that it's not allowing people to um, to mature further in becoming uh, young men, or and most importantly, become fathers. The Sunday centric model only allows a certain number of people to be called or feel called, and it only allows a certain amount of people um, to participate or to reproduce. So what we've done is we've said in the, in the past, what we've said is is hey if you're a young man you're strong in the word invite some, and you have a conversation with a coworker at work invite them to church and then and then you know we'll get them saved and and you've reproduced but the problem is is basically it's like us asking you to have a baby and then but we're going to adopt that baby for you which okay that works um to a degree but it really it it doesn't help you mature as a father mother in the faith to the degree that it should i read a quote from and this is kind of where some of my preaching is going different things that i've been reading and studying and a lot of the stuff that i've been thinking on and focusing on um in my sabbatical and after but i read a quote from brian sanders um a pastor from tampa bay he said the sunday centric churches draw people into an educational environment to learn things like ethics and life skills, this framework has a bias for theory, not practice. It struggles to create meaningful community and largely fails at the work of mobilization. And that line, man, that hit me. It struggles to create meaningful community and largely fails at the work of mobilization. Ouch. Like I read that and I went, ow, oh man. I, I We need to be... I was like, I don't want to fail largely at the work of mobilization. And my first reaction to that was to reject that. No, we mobilize people. What are you talking about? We have volunteers. We had 340 volunteers last week, last weekend for, for Night to Shine. What are you talking about? And yet when I began to focus on this and look at this and saying, yeah, okay, we've got, we've got active volunteers, but we're not, we're not mobilizing people to become fathers and mothers in the faith to the degree that we could. And so that's where I was like, okay, doing a SWOT analysis, we're really good at the beginning stages of, of the chair, the table and chairs. We're really weak at the last stages. So what do we do about that? Number four is we don't need another program. Amen. Raise the roof. We don't need another program. We need to rethink church. We need to rethink Church. I brought this up um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I used the 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 Greek definition of the word repent is is the word metanoia, um, and this is the word that is used all throughout the New Testament. Whenever we read in English the word repent, um, this is the the word that is used in the Greek is metanoia. Metanoia. It literally means that repentance is to have it means to have a change of mind that leads to a change in behavior. So it's a it's a rethinking, it's a change, it's a a readjustment of thinking that is going to result in a change of behavior. So I'm looking at this and saying, okay, we need to rethink, which means we need to repent of or we need to rethink or change the way that we think about church, which is why I preached in October, 
you know, ecclesia and what an ecclesia is and, and looking at it and saying, this is where our roots of, of what church looks like or our understanding of church in the Western world looks like. And this is what we need to kind of rethink this and saying, hey, let's look at what Jesus really meant and what ecclesia is and how we do that. So one of the things that I'm working on rethinking and, and bringing you into and all this is I'm, re I'm looking at saying, okay, is the Sunday centric model enough or is there something or can we bring in or can we talk about uh, a, a different framework or a different model to be able to release and equip people to fulfill their their calls and their destiny so i want to i want to compare that sunday centric model to a missionary framework the word missionary means sent one apostle you know apostle means sent one so how do we send more people so what i mean by that is Right now, we've created a come and see invite culture versus a, a missionary culture would be a go and tell, right? So Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the gospel, right? Go into all the world and make disciples. We, we have a come and see, a, the invite model. And a missionary is a sent one. And this I had a pastor ask me this question uh, about a, four weeks ago, and I can't shake it. He says, if we if we ask, if we invite people to come to church, we're asking them to be the missionary. And I was like, what do you mean? He says, we're asking them to be the sent ones. We're asking them to do the work to 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 come and see. And he says, and we're and we're we it's easy on us, it's difficult on them. And I went, oh. Ouch. So what if we were to rethink really and go, okay, instead of come and see, how do we do just, just, and again, I'm not saying we need to change what we're doing because what we're doing is working at the first three stages, but how do we, how do we create more of a go and tell missionary sent model where we do the work? What if we, Ephesians 4, equipped the young men to be missionaries, to be sent ones? What if you know, what if we equipped, which is what Paul says in Ephesians 4, equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. What if we equipped, trained, skilled, developed to, to send and sent missionaries, sent the young men into their workplaces, into their neighborhoods, into their schools, into that. What if we equipped properly and sent them into the community rather than, than saying, hey, everybody come and, um, and see and meet Jesus here. What if instead of focusing on running new programs, we focused on equipping more people? And what if we rethink one big church and start planting hundreds of ecclesias? What, what if? And, and when you look at that and going, well, that sounds crazy. It, um, and it sounds different and crazy, except, except that it's biblical and except that the fact that one of the things that I, I, I learned is that the church all around the world is exploding at an exponential rate, except for in the Western world. And the reason why the church all around the world is, is exploding and the, work, the church in the Western world isn't is because our Sunday centric models are limiting our discipleship where in the Western world. For example, in China right now, 60% um, of the house churches in China, which, by the way, are exploding, 60% of the ecclesias in China are led by teenage girls. And I went, what? <laughs> Wait. And here in, in, in our Western world, we think, well, I don't know enough to be sent. I don't have, I don't have enough. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. And, and we think we because we're knowledge based and we think on, on this regard. But what if we were to empower, equip and send? And what if we were to um, equip more people? And what if instead of having just one pastor, what if we released hundreds of pastors? What if? What if? Um, here's another quote from. Brian Sanders in this regard, he said this, 
In the prevailing framework of the church today, talking about the Western church, leaders are constrained to serve only those who come into their ministry fear, sphere, their church building or programs. The ministry then is limited to only their capacity and the capacity of that sphere. This also means we are often chasing our tails, trying to serve people who are disinterested in the kingdom. Many people will claim to be Christian, but their true desire is to be served, to be fed, and to consume. Sounds like little children. <laughs> then he says, serving these people is hard, expensive work with very little kingdom fruit. In the missionary framework, church leaders strive to serve the 20%. It is the apostle or missionary who is served, and in turn, the mission is itself is expanded. The role of the centralized church is to serve those who serve others. I'll say that again. The role of the centralized church is to serve those who serve others, and in so doing, multiply their ministry. Wow. So good. So what do we do with this? Doing this SWOT analysis as we uh, wrap this up. What do we do with this? Number one, honestly identify where you are on your spiritual journey. So when you look at the table and chairs, be honest and identify where you are on your spiritual journey. And if you're still a dependent, then get into a rooted group, right? Um, or or reevaluate and going maybe I know more than I uh, than I should or you know than I actually think I do, but I honestly identify around the table and share where you are in your spiritual journey. Number two is discover your God given calling, and we talked about this two weeks ago by focusing higher, anchoring deeper, growing smaller, loving louder, and in the midst of doing that, you're going to discover your God given call that God has made you on purpose for a purpose for such a time as this, that there's, there's a calling, a ministry that God has created for you. Um, and that ministry, by the way, is not within the centric church. That ministry is most likely the majority of us have ministry that is actually in the community somewhere, in the workplace somewhere. Um, what is that call? Discover that God-given call. Number three Talk with your campus pastors of how we can better get better at equipping the saints. So one of the things we're going to do right now, we're going to break out, have some discussion with our campuses um, and, and answer this question. You know, how can we get better at equipping the saints? What, what can we do? Talk with the campus pastors. You guys can can lead this. Um, Pastor Jeremy, you can lead the discussion with Lethbridge because Pastor Ruff's in, I think he's leading Rooted tonight. Um um, and then also wanted you guys to all be aware that we are working on and uh, preparing missionary training or equipping training, specific training for missionaries that we are going to be launching sometime this spring in the next uh, month or two to be able to um, equip and send um, as well as do come and see and go and tell. See what happens.